Byron invited me uh, to call this a cacophony this morning. And I said, a cacophony is when the whole orchestra is warming up. He was worried about it. It was awesome. And, and uh, Caleb invited me to dance during it. <laughs> but once you got going, I didn't want to interrupt. That was <laughs> so good. Thank you. Thank you. You might be wondering, how come everything sounds like Pentecost this morning? I don't know. Did you notice? We're talking about the Holy Spirit and all that. If you were here last week, I, I mentioned that we were going to be moving into the book of Acts. We read a scripture from Acts last week as we moved into communion. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot going on last week. I didn't really have time for a sermon. So... Uh, uh, today, we're going to pick up there in that place, uh, and we're going to be in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, for the next nine weeks, today and eight more weeks, um, because this is a lively book, and um, I'm in love with it, and I think we all should be. Let's pray together. God, please, please come and move us. May we feel your Holy Spirit. May we be inspired as those early disciples were. Is that beginning church? To, to be your people in remarkable ways that we have never considered. Come and speak to us. Move us. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of every heart be pleasing to you, O oh God, our Savior and our strength. Amen. Well, our reading this morning comes from the second chapter of Acts. I'm going to read verses 43 to 47. Listen for the word of the Lord. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. <laughs> They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Try as I might, I cannot actually imagine this story happening in reality. <laughs> I mean, how about you? Honestly. What? The giving away of everything, the living in perfect harmony and unity. Really? I, I, I mean, I feel glad if my family can agree on something, you know? Or my husband and I, no, I'm just kidding. My husband just does what I say, and we don't have to. Can you, oh, come on. We, we, tomorrow is our wedding anniversary. And thank you. We've been doing it together mostly well. Uh, for these years. But honestly, can you imagine a bunch of unrelated people coming together and living, not just with one another, but literally for one another for any length of time at all? Every time I read this story, I wonder how long this like period lasted. A few months, maybe? I'm a couple years at the most. It's pretty soon coming up. We're going to see even next week the dissension started to raise up. The, the tribulations came, you know, people were being stoned. They argued among themselves because some people thought that things weren't fairly distributed and they had to work things out, but they did. They worked them out. But, I, you know, I remember the last time my extended family came together and rented a big old house when it was somebody's wedding. And uh, it was awesome and so much fun at the same time that I just held my breath waiting for a brawl to break out at any moment. <laughs> Honestly, I, I love my family, but, you know, some of us are just harder to get along with than others, <laughs> I'd say. And here you have unrelated people 
who are thinking of one another and their driving desire to bring everyone else into the fold. That's remarkable. We have to remember, too, that these people had already been practicing a religion for their entire lives. I mean, it's not like this is just a continuation of what they've been doing, right? They stayed in the temple. They kept the religious practices, but they were doing something different alongside of that. They had all these habits and practices that they developed, you know, that, and that literally identified them as Jewish people and they'd been doing this for centuries and centuries, practices that had been handed down to them from their fathers and mothers and forefathers and foremothers and going all the way back, you know. They have that list of names of the, the people who have made them who they are and brought them to this place. Their history was recorded in... Hebrew scripture. I mean, we still have the text today. And they had dozens of other tomes that set their identity in stone and placed guardrails around their behavior. And now some guy, some guy named Jesus comes along. This is a name as common as John or Joe. And our, you know, it's a common name. And he has declared himself the Messiah and he has been executed for his rabble rousing. And somehow this dude becomes the focus of a whole new, I don't know, what do we call it at this point? We say that the coming of the Holy Spirit was the birth of the church. But here I see people who are in a church, in a temple. They're worshiping, they're doing things. So what do we call this? Is this a... A renewal movement? It certainly isn't a whole new religion, at least not yet, not at this point. Lots of people who have been interested in what Jesus has been saying and really has been interested in what he's doing, really, because, right, he's been healing, teaching, uh, giving new life in all kinds of situations and to people with many different ailments, literally even raising people from the dead a couple of times. This is a fresh hope in a world that has become nearly hopeless at this time. But, you know, in the end of Jesus' time, it got weird. And by the time he was arrested, there were maybe a couple hundred people who were still willing to admit that even known him? Most of the others were satisfied enough with the way life was going and they didn't want to risk that for some thing that they did not know to be true or right, a divisive figure in their history. And recent history hasn't proved them wrong either. Even if there was a rumor that this guy is not actually dead, you know, those disciples are cowering in fear. This is the scene. This is the reality for the birth of Christianity in first century Jerusalem. It doesn't make sense that people would commit themselves to this, does it? Something extraordinary had to happen and that extraordinary something was the arrival of the Holy Spirit. We celebrated it in May on Pentecost Sunday. Most of us wore red. We made a joyful noise. Uh, maybe it was a cacophony. I don't remember. As we do every Sunday, we celebrated. We were happy. We, we left feeling great. And we went to lunch. And then we went home for our nap. And we forgot all about it. Just like we do every week. But these people, these first-hand eyewitnesses could not forget. Everything was fresh and new and exciting. They had been called to a different way of being. And they were fully on board and they were full of enthusiasm for it. Theologian and Yale professor Willie James Jennings says that a new social reality had taken hold of the people. And this reality centered on three points. The apostles' teaching and communion. I would break those into two different points and say there are four. 
the apostles' teaching, communion, the sharing in meals, and prayer. And we hear this and wonder what the fuss is about because this new social reality has been around for so long for us that it's not only not new, it's the accepted norm. When we encounter people in our lives who don't understand this norm, it's kind of shocking, isn't it? When we hear people who don't know our stories and don't know our faith and don't understand what we do, it's it's shocking. At least, you know, our way of practice and rule for this new old thing called Christianity is widely known and accepted. It's just not exciting anymore. It's, you know, lost its luster through the years. Now, don't, don't get us wrong. We're glad it happened, obviously, really glad. But the relevance to us and to our time is, well, it's historical. It tells us a bit of how we came to be, much like the story of how our parents met or the birth of our first child or wedding day. Those milestones in our lives, in our history. If we do genealogy, it was our great, great, great grandfather was related to Abraham Lincoln. The bearing on our lives now is significant, but it's not really a vital part of our daily existence, right? Even though it changed everything, nothing has changed for us. It's true, right? Is it true? And if it is true, is it okay? There are Christian denominations who believe that the most remarkable gifts of the Holy Spirit were given only to the apostles and only for that specific time and place and that they are no longer active in our time. What do you think? Mm, I call hogwash. (laughs) The Holy Spirit invited the Jewish people into a new reality, and we are still being invited into this new reality. Even out today, new ministries are still being birthed. New movements come alive. We watched one happen last month in the movie, The Jesus Revolution, right? We kind of relived that period in history where the Holy Spirit was active and alive, doing a new thing really fast. It happened in our own denomination of Methodism and all the little branches that it has borne through the years. John Wesley never intended to start a new church. His was a renewal movement of the Spirit in the Anglican Church, the Church of England. But it was a movement that could not be contained And when it made its way to the Americas, well, you know, us feisty rebels weren't going to have rules made for us. The Spirit is still in us today, calling us to act in good faith together. The Spirit is in new ministries that are, are, are developed and in our efforts to continue faithfully the ministries that we have already born. But we have to be open to new ideas, or even the ones that threaten our comfort zones a little bit. The work of the Spirit through the church, it's going to be our focus for the next several weeks. And I'm going to encourage you to read through the Acts of the Apostles as we go. Just pick up. It doesn't matter, you know, if you stay with us or behind or in front. Just Pick up before you take your nap this afternoon. (laughs) When you get home from lunch, pick up your Bible and begin to read the book of Acts together. I believe that we can create a stir (laughs) among ourselves and in our community. We can wake up to what God is doing among us. We can refuse to be bored with our faith and assume 
that the movement of the Holy Spirit is history. And the movement, it might not be ours. It might be something that we, we give birth to, as, as this church has throughout its history so many times. Uh, given birth to ministries that expand and get bigger than the church and go and have their own buildings and do their own things. And maybe something that comes to be here in our building as we um, offer our space to other churches or other um, ministries for office space or whatever God does with the, with the offering that we give. We have to be ready <laughs> to say yes, even if it pulls and stretches us a little bit more even if it surprises us, we weren't quite ready for it. Even if it asks us to get on a roller coaster, we have to be ready to say yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.